Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm Joshua Mack. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at the museum, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to our fourth keynote event of today's inaugural Jewish, New York Jewish Book Festival. Uh, this keynote is on writing a life in film with A.O. Scott, Mark Harris, and Annette Insdorf. We hope that um, you will explore and have had a chance to explore some of the 32 events that are happening throughout the museum today, meet some of the 85 speakers, and get books signed at one of the 72 author signings in our main lobby and events hall on the second floor. For those joining us via li live stream, there are three more keynote events today. You can find the schedule at nyjewishbookfestival.org and purchase the books at mjhnyc.org slash shop. While you're here, we also encourage you to take the time to visit our exhibitions, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, on the main level, and Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Scholler on the third floor. Andy Goldsworthy's Garden of Stones, which is the only Andy Goldsworthy um, installation in New York City. Um, I think there's one upstate, um, is also worth a visit. And it's right outside our Cafe Locks. And the whole op museum is open to you today. You can pick up holiday gifts and books at the Pickman Museum Shop and visitor services on the main level. And we are encouraging people to wear masks in the museum and hope you will share feedback with us in our post-festival survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. This program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority, and your donations also help us present these programs. I have a question. How many of you have been to the museum before? OK, great. And how many of you had actually not heard of the museum before this event? Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator for the panel, and then she will introduce the two panelists. So Annette Insdorf is a professor of film at Columbia University's School of the Arts and moderator of the popular Real Pieces series at Manhattan's 92nd Street Y, where she's interviewed almost 300 film celebrities. She is the author of the landmark study in, in Indelible Shadows, Films in the Holocaust, with a foreword by Elie Wiesel, Double Lives, Second Chances, the Cinema of Christoph Kislowski, Francis Truffaut, A Study of the French Director's Work, Philip Kaufman, and Intimations, The Cinema of Wojciech Haas. Her latest book is Cinematic Overtures, How to Read Opening Scenes, currently in its fourth printing. Um, so again, thank you very much for joining, and here are our panelists. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to see you and welcome also to those of you who are live streaming. I understand that quite a few people have signed up for the virtual option as well. So um, the, uh, I, let me first introduce the two gentlemen that I think are among the best writers on film in the United States. Uh, first, Mark Harris. He writes regularly about popular culture for publications, including New York Magazine. He is the author of Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood, which was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, 2008, and won the 2009 Theater Library Association Award. His Five Came Back, a story of Hollywood and the Second World War, is not only a great book, but the basis of one of the most powerful series documentary that I have seen on Netflix called Five Came Back. Um, he is, his latest book is the biography Mike Nichols, A Life. And I'm proud to add that he is a graduate of Yale University where he was a student of, among others, yours truly. <laughs> Welcome to Mark Harris. And then A.O. Scott has been film critic at the New York Times since 2000. He has reviewed thousands of movies along with essays on cinema and literature. In 2010, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Criticism. His book, Better Living Through Criticism, How to Think About Art, Pleasure, Beauty, and Truth, that's a mouthful, was published by Penguin Press in 2016. Of all the reviewers out there today, I have to confess that I go to him first when I want to learn about a new movie because his reviews are informed by a deep sense of film history 
and they reveal how intelligently one can write about movies for the mass audience. Welcome to A.O. Scott. So by way of introduction, I guess the three of us are motion picture folks. Um, we have written books and essays primarily about films that often engage with Jewish material. Now, sometimes the subjects of our writing, the subjects could be Jewish, like Mike Nichols for your, auto, for your biography. And I think there might be an indirect Jewish component uh, of how we engage with our work, namely a questioning. Questioning that can be traced back to Talmudic origins, perhaps. Um, I taught a class a week ago. I do a 90 Second Street Y online class on Sunday evenings, and Holocaust cinema is the topic these days. And one of the participants asked, what is a Jewish ending? Because we were trying to figure out what makes the difference between a Jewish ending and something else. And a few answers were proposed, and I think the best one was offered by my husband, Mark, who's an actor and teacher. And he said, a Jewish ending is a question. And he proceeded to suggest that Elie Wiesel even incarnated that because he would often say something profound and then, after a pause, two words, and yet. There would always be that opening of a door to some other way of looking at this. So um, the questioning, well, we're, we're gonna come back to that, but I'm gonna start with a more basic question for each of you, to what extent do you think that your writing about film um, and your Jewish identity come together? Um, uh, I, th I think it's a really interesting notion and I should say that I probably came to my Jewish identity later than a lot of people I know did. Um, I grew up, um, uh, my father was Jewish, my mother was Catholic, and um, I uh, grew up in one of those kind of Manhattan, like, we celebrated Hanukkah, we celebrated Christmas, we had Passover, um, we, I didn't get bar mitzvahed, I got yelled at for not getting bar mitzvahed. Um, it, it, I, I grew up culturally Jewish, but my first experience of it was my father saying to me when I was about six, you're a Jew because I, want you to understand that when they call you a, like a dirty kike on the schoolyard, that's what they're talking about. And I was like, we don't have a schoolyard. <laughs> You're sending me to private school with everybody's Jewish. <laughs> I, like, I don't understand it. So my, my first understanding of Jewishness was that it was somehow bad news, um, something that was gonna get you beat up. And, and so it took me until I was an adult to come to my, my Jewish identity and, and longer still to come to it as a, a writer. Um, and I think questioning is, is such a nice word because when you said Jewish quality to the work you do, I thought like angst, neurosis, worry. Um, but, but I think that's all sort of part of it. Like you're, you're, as a writer, I think you're constantly in an argument with yourself. You're, you're, you're making an assumption and then challenging that assumption. You're looking at something and then saying, is there another way to look at it? I think it's especially true of what Tony does, you know, sort of deep cultural analysis. And um, I think Jewishness, which has such a great tradition of disputation and argument, um, is surprisingly good training for that. I mean, I think like, like you, I grew up um, in a family that was that was mixed. My 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 mother is Jewish. My father um, is is not, <laughs> and um, I didn't grow up in New York. And for me, um, the sort of the, the the content of my Jewish identity for a lot of the time that I was growing up was my grandparents and my mother's extended family, you know, back in 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 Brooklyn, which which kind of represented sort of. The old country, in a way, you know, it was where, in those days, there were not, you know, there were not really bagels that 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 were at all edible outside of um, New York City. Um, I'm, people in Philadelphia or Montreal may argue with that, but you know, who are we kidding? Um, and uh, so it, it it was 
Um, a cultural identity, I have to say, without a strong religious content. I didn't have a, a bar mitzvah either. I didn't really know anybody um, who, who, who did um, where I was growing up. And I would say that for me, in a way, the, the, the accumulation of Jewish culture and a sense of my own participation in it and belonging to it came a lot through culture and popular culture. You know, came through Mel Brooks um, and Philip Roth uh, and and Woody Allen and Mad Magazine, um, and was a tradition that was questioning um, and critical and also skeptical uh, and um, irreverent and kind of at an angle from what seemed to be um, the, the sort of the, the, the mainstream um, or, or, or the norm. And also I would say, although I, I kind of came to this later, um, and this is where I think that my grandparents um, were very much uh, an influence on me, is a sense that it's, 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 it also involves a kind of an, an ethical obligation um, <clears throat> to be engaged with the world, to think about um, questions of, of, of justice, um, of decency, um, that you can't get away from the, the, the ethical and even sometimes um, political imperatives that the, that the tradition, however you define it and however you come to it, puts on you. Um, and I feel often in my own writing that, I, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of to, to, to get to that or to hold on to that, um, to articulate that while still, you know, being aware of the spirit of, of, of Mel Brooks and Mad Magazine, um, kind of, uh, you know, as, as on, on, on the other shoulder, if there's the, it's not a Jewish image, but if there's an angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a question, because we're about the same age, and I had the same um, cultural experience pretty much as you did, although I, I, I don't know how young you were when you were reading Philip Roth. That was somewhat, <laughs> I, hope, I hope that was not before Mad Magazine, but. <laughs> as soon as I could reach it on my parents' <laughs> shelf, you know, where they put it so I couldn't reach it, and I knew. But I saw those, you know, I remember as a kid seeing Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein and Sleeper and, and reading Mad Magazine avidly, and I think that I knew that all of those things were funny well before I knew that they were Jewish or that other people identified them as Jewish. I, I think partly because I grew up in, in New York City, that that was just people to me, not necessarily Jewish people. I, I, that's interesting. I mean, because I, I think I remember, you know, seeing when, when like, seeing Blazing Saddles and, and Young Frankenstein and High Anxiety, um, you know, what, living in a small town in North Carolina and seeing them at the sort of the, the, the theater on Main Street um, there. And so it, it was something that, I mean, yeah, I experienced them as, as funny. I can't say I felt a sort of a, an, an awakening sense of, yes, that's, you know, <laughs> That's me up on screen, <laughs> um, but but on the other hand, there were there was there was something that that uh, that did that did uh, call out. But whether whether I was aware, in, you know, it, it's a question I, I that's that's interesting to think about. Sort of when you become aware that this stuff that is just funny um, is also uh, Jewish and that therefore has something to do with you beyond just your consumption of it. My own background is quite different from both of yours. Um, I was born in Paris to Polish Jewish Holocaust survivors. And I think from a very early age, even in Paris, um, I was aware of anti-Semitism because my parents as refugees were experiencing it. We moved when I was three and a half years old to the Bronx. And uh, when I was five, I finally learned English because first I spoke French and when we came to America, all of my parents' relatives and friends didn't speak French and we didn't speak English, so Polish was the only common language. So I learned English in school and realized very early on, not that I was different, but that my parents were different because they had accents. And that's what led me on a trajectory that I think led me into my professional role as an educator and writer, which is also one could say for all of us maybe, a translator of sorts not necessarily linguistic translation, but when we see a film that we love, I think that sometimes we become 
uh, what could be called a high-class PR person if we want to share what we have gleaned from the film and translate that into the kind of prose that will lead people to go and see the films in question. And specifically, you know, to compare to your sides, um, there's something you wrote, uh, Tony, in your review of a film that I really liked but very few people saw called An American Pickle. Um, it starred Seth Rogen in two roles um, as an old Hasid in the, in the old world. Um, who, uh, I, you know what, I'm just going to read you some of A.O. Scott's review. Because he, in that review, I think, delineated much of what we're talking about today. And this is why I love reading him. He, he takes one movie and it becomes a, a, a kind of... Uh, way of dealing with cultural, historical, even political issues. This is October 2009, and you wrote, in the modern world, after all, to broach the idea of Jewish identity is to invoke not one crisis, but many, religion or ethnicity, theology or ethics, culture or ideology, Brooklyn or Tel Aviv. Why does a Jew answer a question with a question? My father, an atheist, a socialist, and a righteous man in the best biblical sense, used to ask, why not, was his version of the punchline to that old joke. So um, that leads me, and, and well, actually, I, I will cut to the end of that review because you wrote, the tough, pious ancestor and his sensitive secular descendant have almost nothing in common and the imaginative challenges to find an identity that can include both more or less as they are. What makes them both Jews? The answer turns out to be simple and at least for this conflicted 21st century Jew persuasive, their shared obligation to mourn the dead." Unquote. So I thought I would throw that into the mix because here you were emphasizing comedy and sort of identifying with a Jewish tradition, whether it's through Mel Brooks or Mad Magazine, but that seems to me also central in both of your work. Yeah, I think as I've become older, it's become more central in mine. I mean, working on my second book, Five Came Back, um, which it, it, it intertwines the story of five directors, and one of them is George Stevens, who, who ends his career as a World War II filmmaker by going through the gates of the camps to film uh, when the camps are liberated, uh, he films what becomes evidentiary material at the Nuremberg trials. Um, and Stevens was not Jewish, um, but it, it profoundly affected him um, and, and, you know, reshaped the rest of his career. For one thing, he, he never made another comedy because he felt he was incapable of it. And this was someone who had started with Laurel and Hardy movies. Um, and then working on Mike Nichols, um, who, who was someone who was born in Berlin, um, uh, but to a very, very secular family that identified themselves much more as, you know, his mother identified herself much more as a German than as Jewish. And uh, his father was Russian, and they did not leave Berlin really until they were forced to. And he took a very, very long time in his, you know, his, his, journey is very familiar to me because it's a journey to go all the way away from being Jewish and from identifying that way. He never lied or anything, but I mean, he, he is someone to, who chose to make himself a blonde. So, you know, an all-American boy, that was not Jewish in his cosmology or, or in the worlds at that time. And then came all the way back to it and, and came to a place where his, his Jewishness and the fact that uh, he was by lucky chance a survivor, uh, really meant something to him. And, and I, obviously his journey is not my journey, but, but uh, the journey of going from uh, understanding that you're Jewish growing up to feeling that Jewishness is really not an essential part of who you are to realizing that yes it is and coming to that on your own terms was very familiar to me, and it was an aspect of his life that I didn't know about when I started working on the book. That's, I mean, it's interesting. To, I mean, to bring it back to American Pickle, a movie that I, I had not thought of <laughs> um, uh, 
very much. Um, to accept that, you know, I was appalled when um, after the the the, uh, the change of regime at, at Warner Brothers, it was pulled off of the HBO um, platform, which I think is a a, a, a terrible um, scandal and and uh, you know um, something that should be uh, rectified. Not that it's a great great movie. You, you can say Shonda. I can say it's, a, it's, 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 it's yes. You're um, among friends. <laughs> A terrible Shonda. I'm not. I'm not going to accuse anyone at HBO of anything. But you know, um, I don't want to. I don't want to be paranoid about it. But come on. Um, but anyway, it 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 is very much about that. It's about and and a, a, a particular sort of American Jewish trajectory, which is um, the the you know the word assimilation doesn't even really cover it. That's already sort of an an an, an obsolete word for the process of. Um, of, of, of becoming an American and becoming and, you know, feeling that you're able to choose what it means to you and how you identify with it and, and, and what it's about. And the, the, the comedy and also sort of the pathos in this movie is between the, the idea, if, I don't know how many of you have seen this movie, but the, the idea is that this, this um, kind of old, rough, shtetl guy who comes to America in, at the end of the 19th century and makes pickles, falls into a vat of pickles, and is preserved, pickled, um, for, for 100 years. Um, and then his great, you know, his, his, uh, his descendant, who's just a sort of like a modern kind of tech guy, hipster, um, uh, not particularly Jewish identified kid, um, finds him in the pickle jar. I don't really remember how it all happens, but he comes out of the pickle jar and he's living in basically, you know, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, a um, hundred years after he had been in Williamsburg, Brooklyn the first time. So you can imagine. But it is, it's about exactly that, 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 that you may go all the way as far as you think you can get from it. Um, and whatever it is, it being this, 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 this identity, this history, this memory, these ancestors, um, but they'll find you. They'll find you. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago when the director, um, Joan Micklin Silver, died, I, I went back to look at her movies, of which there weren't many, but I, I was really struck by, in both Hester Street and Crossing Delancey, how uh, directly she grapples with those questions of, of assimilation and the old country and what it means to be a Jew versus what it means to just be a New Yorker. Um, and, and pickles figure in both. And yes, yes, exactly. Can't there's, get away from pickles. There's a, there's a long pickle tradition in Jewish movies. Um, but it was interesting watching those movies, which which are really worth revisiting if you haven't seen them in a while. Um, I was also struck by how uh, not that many movies um, grapple with it, and not even that many Jewish filmmakers um, choose to take on Jewishness directly. It, 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 it's, a, it's a fascinating thing in, in, in American cultural history because, uh, you know, as there, there were a great many Jewish filmmakers and, and Jews involved in, in, in Hollywood in different ways, but the, the absence, even, you know, as recently as a movie like When Harry Met Sally, of, of a sort of, I mean, that's an intermarriage story, but it's not really... Um, Heavily emphasized in there, you know. Um, right, Jewish, right, but right. not Jewish. Yeah. I, and just a reminder that when Joan Micklin Silver made Hester Street, this was 1975. She and her husband Ray Silver knew that n n none of the studios wanted anything to do with a Yiddish language film that they were going to do in black and white with no stars. It's the first film besides the work of John Cassavetes that was self-financed and self-distributed and despite those facts, received an Academy Award nomination for Carol Kane. That film has recently been restored. I think it's in 4K now, and if anyone has not seen it, it's, it's not just a time capsule of that moment. It's a deeply resonant film, and it's very much about female Jewish identity. No, and I remember going to see it when I was, I mean, I remember my, my parents and maybe also my grandparents going to see it and it was a, it was sort of a big deal because that world is the world that my grandparents grew up in in the Lower East Side and, on, and, and, and in Brooklyn and it and it had never been in their lifetimes you know um, 
represented so directly, so realistically, um, with such uh, with such nuance and, and pathos. Well, I think we all know that for centuries, Jews have been referred to as people of the book. And Joan Mithlin Silver, maybe Barbara Streisand we should throw in, um, Jewish women in particular have become people of the screen. And many of us who write about motion pictures, um, there is, I think, you know, something inherent in the tr translation or transition from recording and using books as a way of unifying, especially when you leave your country, you're in the diaspora, and films, which are, you know, have become, for better or worse, the cultural common denominator of the world. And even if the moguls of the 1930s and 40s did not want to call attention to their Jewishness. You know, Sam Goldwyn was a shmuel goldfish, right? They, they changed their names and they didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't want to make their movies seem to be ethnic, ghettoized, even during World War II, of course, especially during World War II. But I think in our own past few decades, there has been a rather high number of Jewish filmmakers performers, um, and I, I believe that there's a tradition here. When I was growing up, when we were growing up in the 70s, I, I, I'm just struck by, I was thinking about that, um, the, I think it's in Annie Hall, um, the whole sort of paranoiac scene where he says, Jew eat yet? Did you hear him say Jew eat yet? Um, and that was so... That was so real, I think, when, when we were kids, because the, the, there was a kind of cringe factor at the idea of making too much of it. Like, you know, ugh, nobody wanted to be the kind of Jew that like saw enemies around every corner. That felt like a, a prior generation thing, an old country thing. It, it felt like we were all beyond that. And, and and in a way, I mean, it's interesting to me that since then, what, what you're talking about in the last few decades, there are directors as varied as, you know, Darren Aronofsky and Noah Baumbach and the, the Safties that, that kind of in very different ways all claim Jewishness and are, are comfortable with it. Um, I feel like that's a change from when we were coming of age in the kind of New Hollywood era. I think that's true. I think I think I think that's 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 absolutely right. And there were, I mean, there, there were exceptions then. You know, there 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 was Woody Allen, there was Paul Mazursky um, to some extent. But but I think you're right that that it is you know people our age and younger. I mean, you know, um, Noah Baumbach, James Gray, um, certainly uh, certainly the Safties, but also younger. Um, I, I'm blanking on the name, but but a movie like Shiva Baby, you know that 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 right. uh, that, that came out in the last year or so, um, and it 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 is interesting how what what changes is not only I think the individual artist's sense of what it means to them um, or has meant to them growing up, but also a slightly different sense of where in the changing kind of pluralistic tapestry of American culture Jews fit um, and who we affiliate with and who we find solidarity with and how we see ourselves and how we imagine that we're seen. Um, I, I think that that's a fascinating thing to watch change. I, I've been watching just this weekend this miniseries that's on Hulu right now called Fleischman is in Trouble. Um, and I've, I'm really struck at how untranslated it is. I mean, it, it is about this really specific kind of super upscale 92nd Street Y group of young Jewish 30-something and 40-something married people and fathers and mothers, and it's, it's not really interested in making an effort to translate the mores of that particular group of people for for outsiders, it's like it, it gives you enough information to know what's going on, and the, like all the characters are Jewish, pretty much. Um, but it's it's. I don't think it would have been made even 15 years ago when when um, 
there's this long kind of tradition of we don't want to impose ourselves and our ways too much on the culture at large, partly probably because we're perpetually accused of owning the culture and controlling the culture and, and running everything. So there's, there's been for a long time almost this apology about you know, going there too much. And it's interesting to see that lift a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I was here on this very stage talking with Taffy uh, Brodesser Ackner on Thursday night at the beginning of this um, uh, festival, who's, a, who's been a, a, a colleague and friend of mine. And it was very interesting to talk, we were talking about some of that exactly about um, Fleischmann is in trouble, uh, which as a, as a book, you know, sits a little more um, comfortably in a sort of a literary tradition that 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 goes back and you know at, at least as far as Roth and and Malamud and others, but I think you're right that on on television, in motion pictures, in, in visual media, um, to 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 see something that uh, is so um, kind of confident and unapologetic, and as you say, un, untranslated um, in its in its jokes and references. Um, what's interesting about it too is that. It, part of what that series is about is how everybody within this world, um, or the, the principal characters who live in in this um, th this yeah this 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 very uh, um, privileged, wealthy, uh, rarefied world on on the Upper East Side, um, come to feel like outsiders within it, um, even though you know they're 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 all part of it. Um, so it, it's 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 getting at I think some of the internal differences and tensions, which is another interesting topic in Jewish representation and self-representation, that it's not, you know, you're talking about arguing and questioning, and most of the time, who we're arguing with is each other. Right, I mean, every one of these artists that we're talking about somehow gets at disputes within you know, the, there's no really interesting artist is going to present any Jewish community as a monolith, you know, not even a community of two. Yes. You know. Well, and any, any Jewish dinner table scene in any Jewish motion picture is going to be <laughs> people screaming at each other. Right. right? What else, you know, the, the food won't taste as good if you're not. When, when I was getting ready to come here, I was dressed much more casually and suddenly I heard my grandmother's voice who's been dead for 45 years saying like to the Jewish Museum you should go and look like a farmer and, <laughs> and, and then I could hear my father screaming at her saying let him wear what he wants and you know that's like both of those things are are very Jewish and I would just add one detail that it seems to me that the growing emphasis on streaming. In other words, we now are watching more and more, whether it's Hulu or Netflix or Amazon, um, Apple, it needs programming. All these things need to be fed and we are seeing more and more attention to different ethnic groups. Fortunately, there are more stories of African American lives and Hispanic American lives and Asian American lives you know, it, it, much more diversity than certainly 20 years ago. Um, and I'm grateful for that. And just backstage, um, Josh Mack, who, who is running the program series, mentioned to me that we're about to enter into the 45th anniversary of NBC's Holocaust. And when I heard that, I was like, really? 45 years? And m some of my students have pointed out to me that Holocaust in 78, that was immediately after Roots, which was the first major miniseries um, that millions of households tuned into. And I think that whenever there is um, greater attention and respect paid to a particular um, group in the United States that isn't WASP, that opens doors, that leads others to want to share their stories. And when those stories are shared, it fortunately leads people like us to either write about or teach about the importance of these stories. They very often come from oral traditions as well as books. They're not just from you know, literary adaptations. So that, that seems crucial to me. Yeah. I was just looking up Holocaust for a completely different reason um, this week, and it, I found a New York Times story that said that the miniseries, which aired over 
four straight nights, nine and a half hours, uh, was watched at least in part by 120 million people. Um, it's, that is unreplicatable now. No, half that, a quarter of that is almost unreplicatable. It just, you know, one of the, one of the advantages of a kind of monoculture where there were very few options is it was possible to create an event that landed, you know, at half the dinner tables or more in America. Um, and I don't think that could happen now. And then, I mean, then also had in some ways an even bigger impact when it was broadcast in Germany um, uh, right. shortly thereafter. I mean, it was really looked at in, in kind of by, by scholars and critics as, as being, you know, maybe the decisive event in the sort of the evolution of, 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 of post-post-war um, German consciousness and, and the beginning of a, of, a, of a much more overt German reckoning with, with, with what had happened. I was actually living in Paris in 1979 when Holocaust aired in Germany at that time. And I remember, because it, it was in all the news coming into France, which was fairly close by. And to be honest with you, um, that's one of the experiences, NBC's Holocaust, that led me to want to write the book, Indelible Shadows, Film in the Holocaust. I started writing it in 1979, hearing what was coming over from Germany and learning, by the way, over the next two years, how many young German filmmakers felt that they had to make their own versions, that they could not accept uh, a Hollywood-type soap opera as the defining aspect of their own parents and their lives. And that's how I started researching. I, in Paris, you can see every movie all the time, anytime. And I just went to movie houses every day, and many of them were Holocaust films. And then in 1983, Random House published the first version of my book. It had 125 films. Within two years, the French publisher asked me to update it. So I had to add about 50 films. Wow. And then they asked me for a second edition in the United States, to which I had to add another 100 films. And by the time that the definitive third edition came out in 2001, this now from Cambridge University Press, I had to add something like another 170 films. So this is a rather different aspect of writing about Jewish film, or Holocaust film to be precise. But um, it's extraordinary how much of an impact the television films like Holocaust and the mainstream motion pictures like Schindler's List and gr documentaries, you know, whether it's Marcel Ophuls' The Sorrow and the Pity or The Memory of Justice um, or Claude Lanzmann's Shoah, a lot of people, I mean, the further we get away from the 1940s, the more we rely on mediated records, on books, movies, shows that make us aware of that history and its current relevance to our lives. Um, in a moment, we're going to take questions from the audience. I just wanted to bring up one more thing. If you have all these notes that I took of what these people, my, my colleagues, have written that I find so um, interesting. Tony, you wrote that Judd Apatow's films tap, film, film, it was one specific one, I forgot which one now, taps into an easily recognizable strain of Jewish American male identity one that nods not only in the direction of comedians ranging from Milton Berle to Lenny Bruce to Larry David, but also at a broader tradition of sexual insecurity and worldly ambition that zigzags from Saul Bellow to Woody Allen by way of Paul Mazursky and Philip Roth. <laughs> now, first of all, I love that perception. And I was wondering if there's any way to elaborate on that in terms of women's voices in film, is, is there anyone that we can look to for this? It's a, I, it's a good question. I mean, I think I think that that it is true that you know, um, in 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 the post-war decades, even you know, up until through the '80s and '90s, still very recently, um, the the. <laughs> there was not exactly a monopoly, but a sort of a, a, a male dominance on certainly um, movies. Uh, you know, m movies. I think even more than um, 
than books or, 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 or television um, were sort of a, a, a preserve of, of, of male representation and self-representation. Um, but I think certainly, you know, Elaine May um, is, is, is uh, a name to, um, to conjure with there. And I think that there is also more recently um, thinking about, you know, um, Abby Jacobson and Alana Glazer and Broad City, um, Lena Dunham uh, in, 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 in Girls. Um, I, I think there's, there's, there's quite a lot um, that enriches and comments on and critiques that uh, tradition of, 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 of sort of, you know, um, male sexual anxiety and also just male sexual self-obsession. I mean, I would say that, that, uh, that Taffy's book, Fleischman is in Trouble, and, and, and the show is very much, um, if, if you watch it to the end, a very, a very pointed and powerful critique of the dominance of that idea that, well, the story, because it starts out, not to spoil it for anyone, but it, it starts out, oh, here's a story about a guy, a middle-aged Jewish guy, um, having a lot of sex and having a lot of, like, sexual issues um, in his life and being divorced and, 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 and being neurotic. And it's like, oh, here we go again with this. Um, and it, and, and it, it, it really sort of turns in a very interesting and unpredictable way um, 180 degrees to be, in effect, a, a, a feminist critique of exactly that. Actually, there was an interesting film earlier this year directed by Mayim Bialik, who probably most of you know as co-host of Jeopardy. Um, she's quite brilliant. She has a PhD, and she made a film called How They Made Us that starred Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen. It was not a great film, but it was actually an intriguing, very Jewish look at domestic dynamics. Uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, it's, it's great that you brought up sexuality because that is such a also long tradition, um, you know, going back to, you know, singer um, in, in Jewish literature and Jewish culture and Jewish writing. And, and it's, it's very interesting to see these um, younger artists, many of whom are women, um, kind of... Uh, I mean, using the word corrective makes it sound too stern in a way, but but they are doing something new, and they they are saying like the story of Jewish male sexuality and female sexuality that has been told is not carved in stone um, and needs to be reexamined. Um, I have many more questions, but I want to give an opportunity to those of you. I see one person in the first row here. In one second, we've got microphones for you. I'm loud, you don't. <laughs> Do you notice a, a big difference between the American film industry and the European film industry as far as Holocaust seriousness, sense of humor? Um, I mean, I, I'm sort of obsessed with Holocaust movies all the time and Jewish related films, but I've just found in my experience when I search and Google, the European ones are the ones that always seem to get the real intensity and horror of situations, whereas American ones take it much more lightly and don't always delve into the, to the true horrors of it. Do you find, do you find that is true or? <laughs> well, if, if you're in a European country, it's your direct history in, in one way or another. You, you know, it may be your very bad direct history. Um, it may be a good direct history, but you can't escape, like, your country was a part of this in one way or another. In America, it might be your history or it might not be. Um, you know, th there's, there are kind of two separate Jewish traditions um, about the kind of 60s and 70s. There, there were families that where the line from the Holocaust or surviving the Holocaust to the present day was absolutely direct, you know, families families like yours. Um, and then there were other families that were like, we don't talk about that, you know, or, or, or families that were like, yes, it happened, but we're in America now, the slate's wiped clean, this is a fresh start, we're not going to be mired in that. And, and so I think, I, I think American... Um, cultural approaches to the Holocaust reflect that 
division maybe more than European ones do? I think that's true. I, th I think there also is um, just a powerful uh, tradition in Hollywood of there, there, there is nothing that can't be redeemed. You know, that is that, that, that the redemption, it's not that there's a happy ending, but the idea that any story that you can tell can be sort of turned in the direction of, um, of a redemptive or, or a consoling or a, or a kind of meaning given ending. And I think that the, 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 the European films, partly because of that cultural reality that Mark was talking about, but also because of a different canon of storytelling, different tradition of storytelling, are, are able to be and, and tend to be um, much harsher, much more uncompromising, much, about, much more about the kind of the absoluteness of the horror and the, and the, and the break in history that it, that it represents. Um, and some of the most powerful of them do what I think Shoah did, which is, which is um, really the kind of aesthetic breakthrough of that film, which is to show just about everything in the present, which is to say that, that we're not gonna show you know, black and white newsreel footages, we're not gonna do recreations, we're gonna show because we wanna show you what, is he what was here, that this was here, and that there, and, and what has been taken away, what has been erased. There was a very powerful movie still, I think, one of the most um, indelible uh, Holocaust movies that I've seen, which, which came out, I think, about 20 years ago um, uh, by, a, I think, a, a French Jewish director. Um, it was called, uh, I believe it was called Voyages. And it was um, a series of stories about elderly Jews in Europe and one in, um, in, uh, in, in, in Israel, um, many of them survivors. And, it was all shot in present day in Poland and Germany. And, and so you could feel kind of the absence and the loss and that these people had kept going and been and stayed alive in the exact places. So you're in modern Warsaw now and you have to think about, well, what was Warsaw, you know, in the 1930s or the 1920s or before? And it's because of what Mark said, it, that, that it, it, it happened for us in, in America, it can get a little abstract because it's not, we're not, you know, here we are at, at, at a Holocaust memorial, but it's, we're not on the place. We're not, we're not on the site. It didn't, it didn't happen here. The director you're referring to, um, his, his first name is Emmanuel. I just blanked on it. Finkelkraut, his name. Exactly. I think. Um, he, uh, no, actually, I'm not sure. There's an Alain Finkelkraut who's a critic. No, you're right. It's Finkel. It, Emmanuel it, Finkel. That's it. Emmanuel Finkel, he had been the first assistant director to Kishlovsky. Krzysztof Kishlovsky, my favorite director, I was his translator, I wrote a book about his work, not Jewish, but the greatest humanist I've come across in a long time. And it, he had decided to make his own film. And I must say that it, it's very similar to other films. I, I, I watch almost everything still that I can about the Holocaust. The class I'm teaching right now for the 92nd Street Y, last week we began with The Shop on Main Street, which remains a classic of Holocaust cinema, but has the same question of a kind of epilogue, a sort of tacked on ending that one, some of my participants felt was a bit Hollywood because it allows you to leave with, oh, there's a dream scene, it's okay. And t t tonight, after this, I'm showing Korczak, which I think is one of the best films ever made about the Holocaust. Andrzej Vajda directed it in 1990, and it's the true story of Janusz Korczak, a doctor, and uh, he had an orphanage that was relocated to the Warsaw Ghetto. Black and white, magnificent film starring Wojciech Pszczoniak, but also has a kind of coda on it that was controversial at the time and remains so. It's more Hollywood, so to speak. So what did I decide to show next week? Genghis Khan. I bet nobody here knows this film, which is why I've decided to show it. It's a black comedy in the tradition of, and here it's American, a, a tradition of the great dictator in 1940, the Chaplin made, of To Be or Not To Be, made by Ernst Lubitsch in 1942. To go back to Europe, I'd have to go to Lena Wertmuller's Seven Beauties in 1975. It's the story of the ghost of a Jewish comedian who was killed at Dachau, who comes back to haunt the now Bavarian police chief who ordered his death, and he becomes his dibuk. 
Um, there are so many approaches cinematically to the Holocaust, and the film I'm showing after that is Ida. And Ida might be the one that is most familiar to you as a recent European. It's not a Holocaust film per se, it's the legacy of the Holocaust in Poland through the story of a young novice about to take her vows who learns from her aunt, her sole remaining relative, that her parents were Jewish and, and murdered during the Holocaust. And it becomes a voyage to find out what, to unearth the story. So these are some of the approaches, but Tony is 100% right. If you're living in the countries that were directly occupied and destroyed, your films are gonna have a much grittier and less sentimental tone than American ones. It's so interesting to me, given the huge range of movies that you've written about and, and talked about on this subject, that there was this long-standing counter-argument, which is, this should be beyond cinema. This should never be touched. Um, and th this is just an interesting reminder to me that in the long run, that argument about anything always loses. Um, that, that the people who, who feel there is a way to approach this will give way to the people who feel there are many ways to approach this. And, and that, that will ultimately carry the day about any subject. Absolutely right. I could talk about that more, but I'm going to go to another I, I'm trying to see, I have bad lighting for seeing hands. It, just raise it high if you can. We have, oh, thank you, yes, I'm sorry, way down front here. If I may lighten things up a bit, uh, uh, I'm reminded of Groucho Marx on account of the fact that later this month there'll be a four hour tribute to Groucho and to Dick Cavett in conversation. Um, I'd like you to uh, comment on the fact that um, 90, 85, 90 years ago, he was playing these uh, characters, he was never explicitly Jewish, he played his characters such name, with names such as uh, Roscoe W. Chandler, where you might say uh, uber uh, waspish and so forth, but uh, Groucho as a, uh, a proto-Jewish archetype that obviously was co-opted by others subsequently, Woody Allen et al. Yeah. I appreciate your thoughts as Groucho as a Jew. Um, I, I, that's, it's, 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 it's great to bring him up. I mean, because the, the, the Marx Brothers, are, you know, bring Jewish, for one thing, just historically, bring Jewish vaudeville um, into Hollywood in, in, in the most uh, extraordinary way. And... Groucho is the one because he's the he's he's the most verbal the way he 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 talks um, uh, who 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 seems to be in some way the most Jewish even if he's playing and I think part of the joke is that he's playing you know Rufus T Firefly or or these these kind of these these characters who are university presidents and ambassadors and all kinds of things that at the time certainly there were not many Jews in those jobs um, it's certainly uh, in the United States but but that is a, 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 a tradition that we didn't I mean we've mentioned Mel Brooks but there is and I think it's worth it, it sometimes maybe gets um, uh, forgotten or marginalized in the sort of the 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 history of, 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 of Jewish representation and self-representation in, in Hollywood and America, but, but a strong tradition of silliness and of anarchy and, and of just um, absurdity uh, that, that you know, Groucho represents certainly um, better than just about anyone. Yeah, I love that tradition of, of coded Jewish characters, like characters who aren't Jewish, but if you know, you know. And I think you can trace a line from Groucho down into like George Costanza on Seinfeld, the the sort of famous, most famous non-Jewish Jewish character on, on television. And we've got one person all the way in the back on the aisle there. Thank you. Uh, I've been reading uh, Mr. Scott's reviews of my ever since you've been published in the New York Times and you've taken over the mantle from Pauline Kael and we now live in Israel and we consult you first and then Rotten Tomatoes second to see if it's worthwhile to see a movie. I'd be very interested, switching gears, if you could just uh, discuss a little bit how you approach a movie before you've seen it 
and how you approach a review after you've seen it. Um, well, thank you. That, that's, uh, I, 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 I appreciate your, uh, your trust in me, and, and uh, you know, I hope, I hope uh, um, to, uh, to continue to earn it. Um, I, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways um, that I encounter movies, and, and in a way, the, the ideal for me is to know as little as possible um, beforehand, um, to walk in um, as cold as, as, as I can, which often isn't possible just because there is, you know, there is the internet, there is, there is, there is the world, there are, there are publicists who, who are sending me emails. So it's, hard to, it's, it's often hard to avoid um, knowing something about it. And there's just also the fact that having um, done this for a while, I'm familiar with um, filmmakers and actors and, and I kind of have um, maybe, uh, you know, um, thoughts and, and, and prejudices or, 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 or tendencies about them. But I do try, to 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 sit, you know, in 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 the seat, um, and let the thing happen, you know, and and in 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 as open-minded um, and receptive a way um, as I can, um, and not to 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 start thinking about it in advance, um, or or to sort of uh, to to um, to to preempt or predict my own reaction to it. Um, because I'm often surprised. And the thing that is most valuable to me and most useful to me is that surprise. When something happens that I didn't expect to happen. Um, when, when, when I'm moved or touched um, or appalled or infuriated um, or bored in ways that I didn't expect to be. Um, and so a lot of times the, the uh, you know, the, the way I approach it is is to have this experience and then to start thinking about the experience and in the process of thinking about the experience and trying to turn that into some material, some kind of argument that's useful to readers um, is when it can be useful to, to to start going around and thinking well are there you know are there other movies that this is like are there things I should be reading is there is there stuff I should know about if this is a movie you know that that is dealing with some kind of um, uh, historical circumstance or literary source material, what do I need to know about about that? And to and, and that to sort of color in the in 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 the background and to find something, some way of taking all of this material. Because a movie is a very it's a very complicated thing. It's a very complicated art form and the experience of watching it can be quite complicated too. Um, and to try just as a as a as a as a writer to um, take that experience and all of that complexity and make something that that is uh, that's coherent that has some kind of shape and that can be um, of use or of interest to, to to a person reading I gather though that we are at the end of time I don't know if I if someone wants to tell me whether there's time for one more question or not but we're supposed to be signing copies of our books in the lobby in a moment um, uh, I, I think we yeah, I am told that we have to cut it. I just want to thank Tony Scott and, and Mark Harris. It's wonderful. Thank you for being here. Thank you.